Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Z Zabras and uh, Professor Zhang for uh, inviting me. It's a great pleasure to participate this uh, premier symposium. Uh, frankly, I, uh, I, I feel quite troubled uh, because uh, the major theme of this symposium is big data. But my talk has a little to do with big data. Well, <coughs> fortunately, uh, I have some something else that are quite big. I, I'll talk about big machines and uh, big applications. Okay. Not this one. Oh, there's too many pointers. Okay, first, big machines. In the past several years, uh, we have seen very rapid development of supercomputers around the world. And uh, this uh, is especially true in China. For example, we have three very famous leadership supercomputers in China, including Tianhe 1A, Tianhe 2, and Sunway Taihu Light. They are, of course, uh, all powerful systems with very high aggregate peak performance. And uh, a particular interesting observation is that although they are quite different from each other, they are all based on many core architectures, such as GPU, Intel Xeon Phi, and the uh, domestic Sunway uh, many core architecture. So, uh, so it is uh, a key question uh, to design algorithms and write codes that works really well on this kind of machine. And uh, we want to use this kind of big machines to solve real world big applications. Now talking about real world applications, the challenging ones, I will definitely put my money on weather prediction even for today, people always complain about the inaccuracy of weather forecasting. And uh, in fact, the idea of numerical weather prediction goes all the way back to the time when there was no electronic computers. <coughs> in, 1990, in 1922, the Great Britain scientist Louis Fry Richardson described in a remarkable book on his idea for weather prediction by numerical process. And uh, this is a, a picture enhanced later uh, by uh, some other people. Uh, his original picture, the original picture in his book uh, wasn't, uh, didn't look so, so beautiful. Uh, it's uh, like, a, uh, like, like a kid's drawing. Uh, anyway, uh, the great ideas in his book is quite, uh, are, were, were quite inspiring. He introduced uh, a so-called bulldozer uh, approach with ideas of solving the mathematical equations of atmosphere by dividing the whole globe into small pieces and using finite difference method to discretize it. The calculations can be done in parallel by a good amount of workers in a weather forecast factory, which resembles greatly to today's supercomputer. So there are many very inspiring ideas uh, in, in, in that remarkable book written by Richardson. However, his approach failed in a very hard way. Uh, people say that his uh, approach failed catatropically. So what happened? Uh, because atmosphere simulation is a very challenging task. The computational domain is very large. And more importantly, the atmosphere contains many different scales in both space and time. These multiple scales 
run often across six to eight magnitudes. And uh, in order to resolve them, you need to spend a lot of uh, computation cost. The richness in scales is even more demanding for the non-hydrostatic model, which is the most accurate model for atmosphere dynamics. The governing equation is a full compressible Euler equation describing the hyperbolic conservation laws of both the continuity, the momentum, the energy, and the possibly the moisture. It's a first order time dependent system written like this. Oops. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the equation system contains fast waves such as the acoustic wave, the inertial gravity wave, these fast waves are in fact not physically significant, which means that we don't need to resolve them accurately. But they cause a stability issue when you use an explicit method. And this is exactly why Richardson's approach failed. He used an explicit method, and he wanted to use very large time step. And uh, as we all know, that will lead to uh, instabilities. Today, tremendous efforts have been made around the world for extreme scale atmospheric simulation. For example, in Japan, a sub kilometer run was done on the K computer using the Nikan model. And in the United States, a 0 0.16 SYPD was achieved for the three kilometer run using, uh, using the F3 model, which has been recently selected as one of the few gener uh, next generation models in the United States. Here, SYPD stands for simulated years per day, which is quite important in atmosphere simulation. <coughs> in all these works listed here, there are majorly two ways to tackle with the challenges from the fast waves in the non-hydrostatic dynamics. People may either use uh, simplified models, but still need to uh, face the challenge of reduced accuracy, or use a split time-stepping approach that may introduce nonlinear inconsist inconsistency and large splitting errors. And in our opinion, we believe that a uh, fully implicit approach might be a valuable uh, method. Therefore, in this work, we will uh, focus on this approach. Now, why considering implicit solver instead of the traditional explicit ones? Let's take uh, this very simple problem as an example. Uh, when using an explicit method, uh, the values on the newest time step uh, can be uh, independently computed, which means that uh, the parallelization can be easily done. Uh, like uh, you can see here. Uh, but the time step of explicit method is constrained severely by the stability condition. In other words, uh, uh, the time step size could be really small on large scale simulations. On the other hand, the implicit methods can allow larger time steps that are free of stability restrictions. But the unknowns are coupled when you use implicit method, and the cost of uh, implicit time stepping depends greatly on how the uh, resultant linear or nonlinear equations are solved. So, <coughs> so it is very important to design a efficient implicit solver uh, in this matter. And on today's supercomputer, the design of this kind of solver is quite demanding. The reason behind this is the complexity of not only the solver itself, but also the computer we use. We need to uh, carefully consider the uh, concurrencies of different hardware levels, uh, the convergence properties of the solver, and the cost of all types of data moment. 
And uh, for each individual challenge, we may already have some good answers. But an answer to one of these particular questions listed here might be a total disaster to another. So we need to come up with some uh, comprehensive solution. Uh, we need to deal with all these challenges once and for all. And uh, in the history of the ECM Gordon Bell Prize, there are many interesting works for solving partial differential equations by using either implicit or explicit approaches. In the early years, at the beginning of this century, uh, uh, these few works, uh, plenty of works were done to design implicit solvers that can scale to thousands of CPUs in a, num uh, in a number of important applications. But in the recent several years, uh, uh, because of the challenge of the new hardware architecture, fewer breakthroughs were made. And uh, this includes the work on Earth's mental simulations in 2015 and the atmosphere simulations in 2000, uh, 2016. Uh, and uh, the latter one will be the focus of this talk. And this page summarizes our effort in the past 10 years. It's a collaborating research among several institutions in China. And you can see how we made graduate improvements, starting from only a few thousand CPU cores uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, 10 million. And uh, from uh, uh, simplified models to the most uh, complicated ones, and from explicit solvers to implicit ones. Now, uh, before proceeding, uh, let's take a closer look at the architecture of sine wave type of light. I assume, I assume that uh, not all of, us here, uh, all of us here are familiar with this uh, computer. Uh, this is how the CPU in sine wave type of light looks like. Uh, it consists of four core groups. Uh, in each core group, there, are, there is one uh, managing processing unit, uh, the, red, the red one, the s small red square. And uh, there are 64 uh, uh, compute processing elements organized as 8x8 eight eight mesh. So this is one core group. We have totally four core groups in each processor sharing a same memory space. So it's a very unique design of the CPU. <coughs> The computing capacity of this processor is very high, but the, uh, the memory bandwidth to fetch data from the memory uh, is relatively low as compared to modern GPU processors. So when we use this kind of uh, a machine, we need to pay special attention. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, how it looks inside one chip. And uh, we integrate uh, 1,024 of such chips in one rack, and we connect 40 of such racks together, we get the same way type of light system. Uh, so uh, now let's consider how to design a solver that can fully exploit the whole machine. First, uh, how do we get the 10 million cores uh, out of the whole system? It's quite easy, it's a simple mess. We just uh, multiply these numbers together. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are uh, 65 cores in each core group. We have four core groups in each processor. And uh, we have this number of chips in one rack, and we have 40 racks. We multiply all these numbers together. We get a number that's a little bit over 10, uh, 10 million. Now let's consider how to exploit uh, this much, uh, this many processors, uh, cores. <laughs> uh, here, we at least have two types of parallelism to exploit. One is the process level, and the other is the thread level. And uh, uh, you can see them like this, because for the thread level, you can exploit the shared memory parallelism, and for the process level, you can exploit the D 
distributed memory parallelism. <coughs> so uh, when we design the solver, we can separate our concerns. The philosophy is that if we were able to design a solver that can take advantage of the process level parallelism, and at the same time, we can design another solver to manage the thread level parallelism, and somehow we are able to combine the two solvers as a whole, then we are all set. So this is a basic philosophy. And, and let's uh, consider these two different levels one by one. Uh, on the process level, uh, we designed a domain decomposition based solver with multi-grade coarse grid correction. And uh, this solver works exceedingly well. Exceedingly well. And uh, as compared to the traditional multi-grid approach, by using this method, we can control the total number of levels to be only a few, so that we have enough working load on all levels. And uh, on each level, we can do a, uni a uniform domain decomposition to achieve very good load balance and the data locality. And for the thread level parallel, uh, now the only thing left last for, to do is to uh, consider how to exploit thread level parallelism. And uh, the amazing thing about our consideration is that uh, when we do the domain decomposition, we can let uh, the cores inside each core group to solve a subdomain problem. It's an easy plug and play uh, on the condition that uh, you are able to design a thread level solver. Uh, the goal to design a subdomain solver uh, includes these uh, considerations. First, uh, we want the solver contains only a single sweep of the data instead of multi sweeps. And we want it to be synchronization free because synchronization among these many cores are quite uh, costly. And uh, in addition to these uh, first two considerations, we also want the solver to have very good data locality. Otherwise, we won't get very good performance. So finally, uh, we designed a novel uh, geometric-based uh, pipeline sparse inc incomplete RU uh, solver, which can greatly improve the traditional IRU because of the carefully arranged data partition and the fully exploited geometric information. And compared to the sequential, uh, se sequential version, the many core acceleration version is dozens of times faster. So finally, we can put these two pieces together. And uh, one thing I would like to add here is that we never really generate a whole sparse matrix in the solver. We only need to uh, we only we only need a small uh, subdomain sparse matrix based on low order uh, spatial discretization, and the indices of the matrix uh, are not really required because we can exploit the geometric information. This can greatly reduce the memory footprint. <coughs> To summarize, our fully implicit solver contains several kinds of kernels, and most of them are stencil-like kernels. And to achieve high performance uh, in these kernels, we need to reduce the cost of data moment such, uh, as much as possible. And uh, all the techniques listed here are for this purpose. Uh, I won't go into details here. And we implement our algorithm based on two software packages. The first one uh, is PETSI, as designed by the Argonne National Lab. Uh, it has, uh, it's a very famous software package. Um, and we have built our software based on its framework. And we did a lot of modifications uh, of PETSI uh, so that uh, the data structure and the communication layers can fit well on semi type of light. Another package we use is called XMath. <laughs> it's a, a high-performance extended math library designed by our group, specifically for Sunway Taihu Light. And uh, 
uh, it's a it's a it's a solver package. It's a package uh, quite like the MKL uh, library on Intel machines. Uh, it contains uh, sparse linear solvers, uh, dense uh, uh, linear algebra, and uh, fa a fast Fourier uh, fast, uh, transform subroutines. Uh, the implementation of XMath is uh, quite a uh, 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 it's quite. Uh, it's not very easy. Uh, we have used uh, a model-driven approach uh, for the design uh, for different kind of uh, computing kernels, and uh, one of the uh, uh, an extreme example uh, in the design philosophy of uh, XMath can be demonstrated here by using the uh, GMM kernel. It described. Uh, the multiplication of two dense matrices. matrices. We multiply these two matrices together, and uh, we add another matrix and store it in the matrix C. And uh, it's a very simple kernel, because we can implement it by using high-level language in only less than 10 code lines. For example, when we implement this kernel, in Fortran, we only need to uh, we only need seven lines of code. Uh, it's very easy; only a few minutes work. However, if you compile this code on high performance computer, you won't get high performance at all. The performance you get could be less than one percent of the peak performance, even for this very simple task. On the other hand. Uh, you can use assembly uh, code. Uh, you can write the whole assembly code, carefully arrange the, uh, the instructions so that you can exploit the, uh, the, the, to squeeze the uh, performance out of the machine. However, the uh, body of the code could be really large. For this very simple uh, application, uh, for this very simple kernel, you need around 2,000 lines of code. Uh, and uh, they are not readable by uh, normal human being. Uh, uh, only uh, you know uh, crazy students can do s this kind of job. Uh, but uh, the, out uh, the, 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 the gain of using this approach is uh, is very rewarding. Uh, you can get a performance uh, which is uh, very high. It's uh, around it's over ninety percent of the peak performance. But uh, uh, let's talk about the rela reality. We, we, we are not able to implement all the kernels in XMath in this way uh, because it uh, costs a lot of human labors. <coughs> so we, we need to find a, a, another way. And uh, we use this uh, uh, automatic code generator to help us. Uh, we uh, characterize the computing uh, pattern of the kernel, as well as the hardware uh, uh, details, uh, also in the uh, in the code generator, and we 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 design this code generator to generate high performance of, uh, assembly code for us. Uh, we don't need to write any assembly code at all, and uh, the code generator can generate the high performance code very efficiently in only a few minutes. And the performance of the code, although uh, may not be as comparable to carefully tune the code by human being, is also very satisfactory. So this is basically our approach to implement uh, most part of our uh, algorithm. And uh, we have uh, used, uh, or the XMS library has supported a lot of uh, applications in China. And uh, this is a, a, a very interesting application I want to mention here. Uh, it's a 2015 Golden Bell Prize finalist. It's the world's largest uh, phase field simulation uh, uh, solving the kahn hilliard equation. Uh, the total unknowns of this uh, application is over 20 trillion. Uh, and the performance by using the XMS uh, is exceedingly high. <coughs> So uh, let's get back to our application, the atmosphere simulation. 
we validate our simulation code with many benchmark test cases. Uh, here are some uh, simulation results. Uh, these are all standard test cases uh, in atmosphere simulation. And uh, our results uh, agree well with uh, reference solutions. And uh, we also want to uh, use the code to solve some challenging problems. And uh, among all those challenging problems in atmosphere simulation, there is uh, one particular interesting uh, uh, choice. It's called moist better plane barrel clinic instability test. Well, uh, it has a uh, more famous name. It's called butterfly effect. Uh, so uh, yeah, butterfly effect comes from uh, atmosphere simulation. Uh, it basically says uh, there is a butterfly uh, flip its uh, wings, and uh, then uh, uh, sometimes later there could be some uh, 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 storm or uh, cyclones. Uh, so it's, it is actually true. Uh, 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 and uh, this uh, test case basically uh, test that. And uh, any decent uh, atmosphere simulation code should be able to reproduce uh, this kind of effect uh, because it's very important <coughs> to uh, describe the uh, cyclones and the storm systems uh, in the middle latitude uh, of the atmosphere. And uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can run the test. Uh, starting from a balanced state with a small perturbation, and uh, some days later, you can see the uh, cyclones generated uh, near the middle latitude. And uh, people usually conduct this test uh, to around uh, 12 days, uh, then compare the results. And we can continue the simulation uh, after 12 days. And we tried the simulation on some other code, and uh, most of the code breaks uh, because of the insta uh, instability uh, issues. But our code runs very robust robustly. Uh, there's no issues found uh, in our code. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, let's examine the performance of the solver. Uh, first, uh, the effect of uh, many core acceler uh, acceleration uh, in the uh, in each core group, we have 65 cores, and uh, we can easily use only one core uh, e uh, out of the core group, and uh, we use MPI to do the <coughs> distributed memory uh, parallel, uh, parallel, uh, parallel computing. But inside each many core uh, chip, uh, it's not very easy to achieve high performance. And uh, we have applied uh, many optimization techniques. Uh, I didn't uh, go into details uh, uh, earlier in this uh, talk. Uh, but we can see the result of these uh, optimizations. Uh, the upper part of the picture shows the uh, final acceleration of the implicit solver. We also designed an uh, explicit solver. Uh, and we show the performance of it uh, in the uh, uh, lower uh, panel of the picture. <laughs> and uh, the result is that uh, the speed up of the explicit solver on the 65 uh, 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 cores uh, is over 100, and uh, the speed up of the implicit solver is over 50. Uh, it's not as good as the uh, uh, explicit solver because it's much more complicated, but still the acceleration is quite satisfactory. So. Uh, we can say that we have made best efforts on both sides. So we can compare them and uh, draw a fair conclusions. <coughs> In strong scaling test, uh, we use uh, two horizontal resolutions. One is two kilometer resolution, and the other is three. As compared to the previous state of the art, uh, or fully implicit code can scale to over 10 million cores with a parallel efficiency uh, over 45%, uh, uh, which are both better than the 
uh, previous work, uh, the work that won the uh, 2015 Golden Bell Prize. Uh, their work was done on the Sequoia machine, which only has a little bit over a million cores, and the parallel efficiency of, their, of that work is only 33%. Uh, for the weak scaling test, we want to uh, use SYPD, the simulated years per day, as I said earlier, uh, to examine the true simulation capability of the solver. And uh, because of the uh, uh, stability constraint of the time step size, the performance of the explicit solver continues to drop. As you can see uh, in this orange line, the performance continues to drop as you increase the resolution and the total number of cores at the same time. <coughs> and uh, on the other hand, the fully implicit solver can do a much better job. Uh, the performance uh, keeps uh, very flat, a little bit uh, 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 decrease, but uh, not so much. And uh, as you compare the absolute performance between these two solvers, uh, you can see the huge improvement, especially uh, when you run the both solvers at very fine resolutions. And uh, when we use a home machine that's over 10 million cores, and the resolution is extremely fine, it's a 488 meter resolution. Uh, and the total number of unknowns is uh, over seven, 772 billion. And for this case, uh, the performance improvement is 89.5. Uh, uh, it's nearly two magnitudes. And, uh, but if you, we examine the performance in terms of the sustained flops, uh, you, you can see that we get another story. Uh, the, the implicit solver can achieve nearly eight uh, petaflop performance in double position. And uh, the explicit solver can, can get a much higher performance. It's a triple the performance of the implicit solver. It's 23.66 peak performance in double position. Why? Because there are two totally different algorithms and uh, we, uh, it's not fair to compare only the flops. The, 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 the explicit method uh, will uh, do more works, but it leads to less, uh, less uh, it leads to uh, uh, performance that are uh, actually two magnitudes uh, lower uh, than the implicit method. So if we, uh, calculate the equivalent performance of the implicit solver, and uh, we consider an explicit solver that has this kind of simulation capability, and we can easily uh, see that we need an exascale explicit solver to do this. So this, uh, uh, this is a very uh, interesting conclusion. <laughs> Now let's uh, quickly summarize uh, this part. Uh, uh, the, the, the title of my talk is uh, Push the Limit of Sunway Taihu Light. Now let's see how the limit of Sunway Taihu Light has been pushed. First, we need algorithm innovations. We revive some traditional algorithms, including domain decomposition, multi grid, and incomplete area factorizations but we carefully modify these algorithms so that they can work on many core-based architectures. And the solver scaled to over 10 million cores as compared to the pre previous state of the art. And the sustained, peak per uh, the sustained performance is also quite high. We can get nearly eight petaflop performance as compared to less than one petaflop uh, in 2015. And uh, we can solve problems as large as uh, uh, 
uh, has uh, over 772 billion unknowns. Uh, and this is also better than the work in 2015. And uh, for the three kilometer run, uh, we can get over one SYPD, uh, which is uh, quite good as compared to the FV3 model, which is the next generation model in the United States. And as compared to the explicit solver, the speed up is nearly two magnitude, which is also uh, very good. Uh, it means that uh, if we use ex explicit me uh, method, uh, we actually get uh, excess scale performance. Uh, there are also some ongoing work. Uh, one is that uh, we are working closely uh, with uh, the Chinese Bureau uh, to build the next generation atmosphere model. Uh, and uh, another is that uh, we are facing some very interesting applications, uh, such as the uh, uh, 2022 Beijing Winter Olympic Games. We all know that there are the, the the PM 2.5 in Beijing uh, is quite uh, famous, and uh, especially in, vi in winter. And uh, in 2022, uh, there will be a, a Winter Olympic game in Beijing. And nobody wants to see that uh, uh, the, the, we, we, we will be covered by those uh, you know, uh, 2.5 uh, pollutions. So we want to uh, do the simulation and help the government to, uh, to avoid uh, the, that kind of uh, uh, craziness. Uh, so uh, another very interesting work we are recently been doing uh, is, uh, uh, is the gaseous wave detonations. Uh, it uh, has uh, many applications, such as uh, mining safety, the design of uh, uh, buildings. Uh, and this kind of application is actually also very uh, challenging because the partial differential equation systems are quite stiff uh, as compared uh, to the atmosphere flow. Uh, they, they are high speed flow with shock waves and uh, we need to use high order method to capture the uh, shock wave to resolve the uh, sharp uh, front of the fluid dynamics and uh, our fully implicit solver works also well for this kind of problem and uh, we can conduct the simulation uh, also with over 10 million cores. Uh, these are uh, some related publications. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to add here is that I didn't have time to talk about fault tolerance uh, in supercomputing. Actually, it's quite important because we are using over 10 million cores. And you can do a very simple math to see that uh, the failure of the machine is definite. So uh, in the future, uh, especially for exascale computing, the average time between failures uh, could shorten even faster. So when we submit a job, we probably need to pray the job won't fail. So this is a very important issue we need to face. Uh, and uh, actually, there is uh, some active research in this direction. But I don't have time to talk about it. I just want to mention it to bring att attention uh, to you. Thank you. You, uh, you, you, you okay, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert for the whole Olympic game. <laughs> I only care about, uh, you know, the weather condition. Uh. So the solar panel, we are just uh, jointly cooperate with the uh, uh, Olympic Games and the electronics engineering. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not quite familiar with this topic. Uh, okay, thank you. First, let me say very impressive uh, type of calculations, but I was uh, wondering if you can comment, you know, when exascale computing 
came about, uh, at least as a concept, uh, everybody was thinking of uncertainty quantification, so effectively running an ensemble of the type of simulations that you were showing. So I am wondering, since you achieved now with the explicit solvers exascale performance, uh, what, uh, you know, where do you see things going in the context of uh, statistical computation using this type of uh, deterministic uh, simulations? Yeah, I mean, is anybody working at all? Because the challenges in a statistical context, the computing challenges are very different from the ones that you presented. Uh, and your question is? Uh, so my question is, is anybody working in actually pushing uh, those things to statistical computing? Stochastic computing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, stochastic computing in atmosphere simulation is very important. and. Uh, uh, I didn't have time to talk about it. I, all the equations I solve are deterministic, uh, but uh, it's the basis of uh, stochastic, uh, stochastic computing. Uh, people use assembly techniques, assembling techniques to do uh, to run the model in many different uh, uh, configurations and uh, to calculate the you know to calculate the probability of a such as uh, raining uh, and uh, some other weather conditions. So uh, it's very important. And uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, cost uh, in that direction. Uh, you need to use a lot of uh, you know, computing uh, uh, capacity. Uh, so it's uh, very costly. Yeah. And uh, if you are able to uh, use uh, some clever algorithm to reduce the cost, it will be really good. Thank you.